Good morning. I see everybody else. Uh, we have a number of people joining. Welcome, good morning to all of our participants. So glad that you're here. I am uh, the first one. I'm Debbie Rosen, and we're going to start in about four minutes. I think everybody knows that uh, we'll start right around 9 a.m. Eastern here. Um, and actually, um, Kathy will be joining us in a moment as well. It's good to see so many people with uh, great planning here early in the morning. <laughs> Feel free to put anything in the chat today that you'd like. We are um, hopefully going to have a pretty interactive session. Um, do me a favor, can you just put in the chat if you can hear me okay? Great. Can you hear me okay? Okay, great. Thank you. <laughs> I heard some other chats thought that, oh, maybe they're not hearing me. Okay, that's great. No, Kathy's joining. Hi, Kathy. Hey. Yay. We did it. You can hear me and I can hear you. Yay. Good and I just heard from the chat that they can hear me. So I, I hope that means they can hear you as well. Can you hear me too, Francis and Cameron? <laughs> and Yay. Susan. Susan, okay, great. Yay. And thank you, Cameron, for your comment. I really appreciate it. We love doing these. There's always a couple minutes to chat before we're officially starting. And I told Kathy this story that, and I'm gonna, I'm not gonna tell the story about how I know of Kathy. Because I'll tell that when we start. But um, I have years and years of experience of wanting people to have sessions like these myself. <laughs> so I decided to do something about it, and that's why we really appreciate the feedback because it's always helpful. And now having a second one, so many years apart, sometimes you forget, right? The things that you were were really great things that worked for your first, or they're so different that it's sometimes it's hard to remember, right? Absolutely. Also, it's, you know, if you get one or two little nuggets from each of these webinars, I, I feel like that's a success. Absolutely. I almost can name all of my nuggets and which webinars they came from or wow. which talks. Yeah. Um, That's pretty good. I have a lot of really good ones from different therapists and um, sessions that I've done over the years. So um, welcome to all the new participants. We have about 30 some on. Um, Lindsay Toms from the Study Pro is on here moderating. So welcome, Lindsay. She's um, our other owner can't see her but she's behind the scenes doing a lot of great stuff and um, let me just make sure sometimes people sign up at the last minute I just want to make sure that uh, we get the link to them so Okay. Hopefully everyone gets the link right here in the last minute, but, um, and it is nine o'clock, so I think I'll go ahead and get started. I'm just gonna go ahead and put the, um, let's see. Um, just one second turn this off here. I wanted to, huh. Seems like they moved this, 
where you Sorry, it seems like they moved where you um, actually put the slides up. Oh, 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 I was wondering. I was trying to read your mind and. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> um, so I'm just looking for that really quickly. <laughs> That's tendy. Very funny, Gina. I kind of wish my camera was was off too, but <laughs> what can you do? Yeah. Hmm. That is very strange. So you're having just trouble, like putting the slides up so that we can. Yeah. See yeah. So we normally they they just um, updated Easy Webinar. And they've um, updated it to make it less easy. Yeah, I think they've updated to make it less <laughs> easy. So I, I apologize for that. Um, going into settings. Offers, participants. Yeah, we have a lot of participants, so we appreciate that. Okay. Can I do anything on my end? I'm just sitting here, not being very helpful. No, I was just looking to see if there is a. Um, Lindsay, you don't see anything, do you? Do you have a, a thing that says share up at the top? Yeah, I thought that I would. And does it, you don't have that? Because I do have that. Um, oh, well, maybe you can share. Maybe somehow I'm not should be able to share. Um, oh, wouldn't that be funny? Yeah. If I actually am able to do Oh, there oh. you go. Oh, thank you. Wow. Lindsay, you're awesome. So someone else is going to have to do the, uh, do the slide. That one of the was slides. me that did that, which is really kind of frightening. Okay, so that Kathy, means I have to click a button and think and speak at the yes. same time, which is so, luckily I'm not chewing gum. <laughs> Kathy, I think that's great. Somehow um, they they gave the co-host the opportunity to share the slides. So apologies for everybody to everybody. That was a little bit of a, a new thing. So Kathy, as you can see, there's like little arrows. Um, so that'll be how you move the slides forward. Do you yes. see those? Awesome. Okay. Well, we can move to the first one. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Yay. You cue okay, me. Well, you cue me. And I'll, I'm very compliant. <clears throat> yes. Thank you. And thank you, Kathy. Thank you all the, to the, all the participants. And I think everyone learned how to use the chat. And I appreciate your patience with us. So this is what, um, when Dr. Dalton, who is runs the Center for Anxiety and Behavioral Change, came on and um, something similar to this happened. He said, this is a great example of how we have to be very flexible. So that leads us right into um, the study pro. <laughs> My name is Debbie Rosen. For those of you who are new to us, welcome. Um, and I can't wait to introduce Kathy here in a second. But for those who don't know who we are, um, we are an executive function and study skills center. And what that means is that um, we help with those set of mental processes that help you do a lot of the things you see here in the right. Um, things that have gotten so much harder in this last year, but certainly have been challenging students for quite some time and adults as well. Um, if you want to go to the next slide, um, we look at all of these um, capabilities, if you will, as skills. And because executive functions are developmental, um, we develop them certainly in our teens and to our 20s and sometimes young 30s. Um, and we are asked to do certain things like long-term papers or studying for tests or even things in our jobs, et cetera, that sometimes um, require greater level of executive function than we might have. So we might have a hard time getting started or transitioning um, or breaking down work, et cetera. And so we've created the Study Pro to help students um, build those skills, kind of build those executive function muscles. 
And um, as we're coming toward the end of the school year, we do a lot over the summer in terms of classes for executive function, study skills, uh, writing, and we're actually introducing a math course, uh, which is not on our website yet, but to help really with some of the um, fundamental math concepts and challenges that kids have in terms of uh, rushing through work, breaking word problems apart, a lot of the things that are executive function oriented. So we're pretty excited about that. Um, so we're going to the next slide, which is the very exciting reason that we're here. Um, I wanted to share a little story about um, my relationship with Kathy that I think she didn't even know about until we first started talking about this webinar, which is that I have a now um, happy and healthy and successful 21 year old who's in college who had a really pretty rough start of it. Um, he uh, had uh, a lot of social emotional and executive function challenges, was diagnosed with ADHD very early on. And we were told that the place you had to go was this organization, a center called INSTEP and to do um, the Stepping Stones program. And I'll tell you um, to this day, as I started to say a little bit earlier, um, that was probably one of the most fundamental and helpful programs that my son ever had, um, really teaching almost the social emotional side of what I see now as a lot of executive functions for kids that are challenged. Um, again, they have not necessarily developed those social emotional capabilities the same way I was talking about executive functions, and then they therefore have to be taught. And what I love so much about Kathy's program at the time, and I still love, and I think all of you appreciate about this webinar today, is that it's really very um, strategy heavy, very specific in terms of helping kids. I'll never forget the triangle of social skills. And we started at the bottom and we moved our way up to the top and the parents were involved and the kids were involved. Um, and of course, since that time, Kathy has grown um, her, her center and she has done so much more in terms of groups and moved over to um, a much broader range than just social emotional. And Kathy, I'll certainly let you share that. But um, I think as a foundation, um, that's such an important piece and something that I've been so grateful for. Um, so Kathy, I will certainly let you add anything else you'd like to, to add, but as an author and an expert that's uh, looked to uh, both nationally and internationally on radio and TV and um, certainly in forums like this, please share a little bit more about yourself. You know, um, <clears throat> it makes me feel so good when when I hear stories like that, of course. And um, <clears throat> I think that what I've noticed over the years and what sort of encouraged me to write this recent parenting workbook is that um, the kids really were not able to build the social skills that they really needed without parent help. Um, so we have this, you know, marvelous group of parents, yourself included, who are willing to actually come to the Stepping Stones groups week after week. Uh, you know, part of what I think made the make the groups so um, beneficial to kids, but also families, is that the parents have buy-in also. And especially with the younger kids, you know, we're doing groups for, for four-year-olds and five-year-olds and six-year-olds too. And they're babies, you know, even elementary school age kids are, are babies from a social perspective. Um, they need a lot of support and practice and encouragement and sharing in the language of social development. And it wouldn't really happen as well. The skills would be much tougher to generalize without the parents part of the equation and so that's like that's on you Debbie you know <laughs> you have to give yourself some major uh, credit there because <clears throat> it's a long process too it's not like mm -hmm. oh just come to our little social skills play group for five weeks and your child will have a high social and emotional IQ yeah exactly yeah. it was a lot of work it's a big commitment um, it takes time to make change yeah. And it's the same thing with parenting skills, like what we're talking about today. It takes a lot of effort and intentionality to change your parenting skills. Mm -hmm. It sounds so easy. Oh, 
oh, now that I know this, I'll just do this. Um, mm -hmm. It's not that easy because we have our own individual temperaments. We have um, our own different parenting styles. Sometimes our parenting styles might work better with one of our kids than maybe with another one of our kids. And so that means we have to shift our parenting styles to adjust for a, for a different child. Um, that's really, really hard. And then I think what becomes, uh, what I've noticed over the years is parents will frequently skip over themselves. They sort of, um, they don't necessarily underline the progress they're making that, you know, and it's hard with a lot of the kids uh, that we see and the parents that, that we see, um, the kids don't through feedback and behavior change indicate to the parents, you're doing such an awesome job. <laughs> Dad, look, you said A and I did A, ta-da. You know, our kids don't grow that way. They develop sort of two steps forward, three steps back, five steps sideways. And parents kind of, their heads are spinning and it's very, it can be very depleting and make you question yourself as a parent and blame yourself as a parent. So part of the reason that I wrote the parenting uh, book about proactive versus reactive parenting is sort of an effort to help parents take stock mm -hmm. of themselves and to give themselves credit because nobody else is going to. They're yeah. certainly not going to get it from the kids um, when they they make behavioral changes that are really hard and well, don't and that's, necessarily like work magically right away. You know? Yeah, no, it's that's absolutely true. And I think that's the first thing we're going to start by talking about. So um, if you wanted to uh, actually move. Yep, exactly. To the next slide. You know, the the whole concept of today is that we want to be less reactive. And the reason we want to be less reactive is because that's really what works. Um, there's a lot of conversation about the fact that being reactive and being parenting in the moment is is really not very helpful or useful. And so a lot of what we're going to talk about today is the idea of what triggers us. And um, many times when we come to these types of uh, seminars or webinars, we want to really get to what do we do about it? What do we do about it? How do we become more proactive? But I think what's so important and what we're going to talk about is by understanding what makes us reactive, you know, it will help us to be more proactive. And so that's really what the first part of this session is about. So listen up, everybody, because we're going to ask you um, some questions about what triggers you and we're going to take a little quiz. Um, so, Kathy, do you want to? I go ahead to the next slide so we can talk about us as parents and and really why do you think it's so important that we ourselves look at what we need to do to change before we ask our kids to change? Uh, this is a good slide for me to stop on because yeah, I think you're more in in sync with what is happening with the slides than me. So um, yeah, we have this and then we have the quiz, so you can move to that when you're ready. You know, I, I think that what um, what I think about a lot with parenting is how we get ourselves into a position where we're really frustrated and really upset with our kids because, you know, we can't get them to do what we want. And we know that if they just did what we wanted them to do, their life would be so much easier. Of course, our life would be easier too, but it would be so much easier. And um, and of course, your child's job is to not do what you say <laughs> when you say it because they're trying to figure out for themselves how to be ultimately independent and do things on their own. Um, and what I've noticed, and I want I want you guys to think about this, what do you think, and I'll, I'll look for comments. I've never done it like this where you see the comments on the right. I think it's so fun and interactive. I wish you were in person with me so I could be talking to you, but this is a good second, second best thing. Uh, what has usually preceded an interaction with your child 
when you say either in your head or out of your mouth, I've had it, what precedes it? What has just occurred? Can you imagine a time? Oh, now we're getting, okay. So there was a struggle or an argument. Oh, defiance, right. So they're saying back talk, um, telling them what to do. Well, there's so many comments, I can't read them fast enough. Um, Nose in the phones, getting to bed, siblings fighting, lying, repeating directions or expectations over and over again. You're Homework. a good reader. You're a very good reader. <laughs> exactly. And so th there's a million things. You could see how if you just let your brain go, it's like for the umpteenth time, I love that, for the umpteenth time, he doesn't do what I asked him to do. Take his medicine, clean up your bathroom. You know, it's, I, it's I've nagged now 8 million times and they're still not complying, right? And what do you think happens if once you've said, I've had it, what usually comes next in your parenting repertoire? Do you think when you say, I've had it, whatever comes next is going to be like your best parenting self? Everybody's like <laughs> yelling, 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 explosion, yelling, right? Blowing up or walking away. It's fighting. It's fleeing. It's freezing. That's what we do as humans when we're upset. We fight. We flee. We freeze. And with par as parents, we typically will fight or we walk away because we're afraid we're going to fight or maybe we're afraid we're going to lose it. So typically, if we've gotten ourselves to the point, <laughs> what was I thinking when I decided to get pregnant? Exactly. Perfect. I've had it. This is a funny group. I'm glad you can see the humor in this because you need that, right? When the going gets tough. Um, so I think part of the, what we're trying to do here in being proactive versus versus reactive is to help you so that you don't get to the I've had it. Because once you've gotten to the I've had it, whatever comes next isn't going to be pretty. Would you all agree with that? It's also like when your, your child is having a, thank you. Thank you for that agreement. I feel very validated. Um, also, when, <clears throat> like when anyone is in the middle of a meltdown, your child you know, included or your spouse, that's not going to be the best time to have a discussion, right? Once you've already lost it, your amygdala is like on fire, your brain is launched. Um, it, it's it's going to be just doubling down on messiness, right? <laughs> so what we're trying to do is get you to almost like, uh, ho you know, sort of get a hold of your wise brain, like they say in DBT, dialectical behavior therapy. You want to get in, in touch with the brain that usually is there at work, right? You wouldn't get to a point, generally speaking, at work where you're saying to your colleagues or people who are working with you, you're not saying, I've had it, right? You're such a blibbity blank, blibbity blank. You know, usually we're a little bit more proactive in the workplace. Mm -hmm. And you're going to use those same skills because you have them. You have those skills. The kids are better at buttons, but you have those skills to be able to back it up and plan ahead for future um, problems. Because do you know what they are? They're the same themes that you're fighting over, over and over and over again. Perfect. So good time for the quiz. In, in um, Raise your, your Parenting IQ, which is the, this is a not for sale. I have that too. Oh, good. This is the, the picture of the book. At the beginning of every chapter, or at the very beginning, actually, of the book, there's a quiz for every chapter. So you can sort of see, like, is this a chapter that's relevant to me? Is this a chapter that would help me? And if not, you skip it. So this is the, the quiz for the beginning of the conflict resolution 
And so I want you guys to take it right now real quickly. And if the statement that you're reading, arguments with my child frequently end in us both yelling, you're going to put, if you really think that's majorly true, like you guys have almost got each other in a training cycle. That's what my friend Sharon Weiss, I don't know if you know Sharon Weiss, she's a behavior, she might have talked here. Yes, she has, and she's amazing. She's amazing. Raise your parenting IQ, yep, that's the name of the, the workbook. And I, and I sell it, by the way, at my office for like much cheaper. So we're happy to send it to you or you can come pick it up at my office in Fairfax. Um, you'll see it at the end of the moving from I've had it to I've got this. Oh, yeah. OK, so this this is your um, colleague doing this, right? No, this is me, actually. <laughs> oh, that's you. Oh, OK, I was like, wow, this person really knows what they're doing. Um, she does. That's because it's you. So. Have you got, are you guys working on taking the quiz? If you, if it very much is true, you're going to put a five. If, if it's somewhat true, you do a four. If it, you don't relate to it, just stay neutral. It doesn't feel like you. It just, you know, you, I overreact react when I'm caught off guard. If you're not an overreactor at all, you know, at all put you, it's untrue. If it's somewhat true, you know, that's number two. And that gives you a sense of sort of how much difficulty am I having in this area of conflict resolution? Um, I would say I've done some parenting groups using this uh, quiz. And I would say that of the parents that come in for parent groups, so it's sort of a self-selected group, I would say that of, of these um I would say that they they all at least put somewhat true or true for many of them. Um, Debbie says, I've stopped yelling. I shut my mount, mouth, mouth, maybe, and walk away. Uh, just did that 10 minutes ago. She's resisting going to an appointment a little earlier. It Right, and it kind of changes. What, she, what I was referring to with Sharon Weiss is, she has this um, concept, at least that's the first I heard of this, this concept with Sharon Weiss, and it's the yelling cycle, where your child is training you through their non-compliant behavior to yell, because you as a parent are like Pavlov's dogs. We all are like Pavlov's dogs. So when the only thing we feel we can get them to, to move with is yelling, we will yell. And the kids know that you're really not serious and you really don't mean it until you start yelling. So they don't really do anything. So that is that training cycle. So we've got, we've got some fours and fives. We've got a two. A two is somewhat untrue. That would be something you, you you don't need to focus on that. There's enough to focus on with with trying to become better parents, which we are all the time, right? Um, but if those of you who are getting fours and fives, this might be a good you know uh, chapter, a good area to focus in on. And frankly, conflict resolution is kind of like we all need to work on it. Even I've been working with this stuff for years, and I'm still. I would still get my fair share of fours and fives. I probably decreased now to what used to be fours and fives now are like, you know, threes and fours and maybe even all the couple of twos in there after all this work, you know. Um, so, Kathy, from a slides perspective, not the next one, but probably the next one, the one we want to go to. Not that one, yeah. Uh, or the, that one or the next one. Okay. Because we kind of talked about this. So, so I think the next one is kind of what sucks us in. Okay. The 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 reason we want to know about these button pushers, just by the way, is if you know what pushes your buttons, you can be more planful in how you respond to it. So if you know inevitably the homework is going to be a battle. 
and it is night after night, and you go through the same routine of nag, 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 resist, 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 yell, maybe a little less resistance, and then the next day it's rinse, repeat, <clears throat> then that would be on your, I've got to do some thinking about this in advance, because this is not working for me. I don't like this as a parent, and I don't like, and, and I don't like this for you as my kid. Um, also breaking electronic rules, right? I think a lot of times we, as parents, we get into this sort of, um, consequence, like we are, we have only a few choices. We, we ask for compliance and then when they don't give it to us, we punish. And with some kids, that doesn't work very well. It feels somewhat satisfying as a parent to like, there's got to be a consequence. You know, this rule was broken and there's a consequence. So it feels good. It's an attractive, tempting thing to do as a parent, but it isn't that effective. And ultimately we want it to be effective or we're going to be doing this rinse repeat thing over and over and over again. So what do you do, especially, and this is especially for those of you who have early teens or teenagers, because our role as a parent shifts greatly when we are going from parenting a kid who we can literally pick up and move to where we want them to be, and we're parenting a teenager where you're not going to win an argument with a teenager, right? You have to, you're, you're becoming more of their consultant. You've done a lot of leading the horse to water for a lot of years. And you know now that it's really up to them to drink. So how, I just I'm get want to get a little feel. How many of you have uh, teenagers? You hear that, leading the horse to water, because you can't. I mean, you can't do that anymore. So you have a 13, two teenagers, 17, two teenagers. Okay, lots of teenagers. Okay, so we're 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 shifting now. These 13 year, you have a really great opportunity. 10 and 12 year olds, 13, 14, 15. You're starting to move with the idea that in a few short years, these guys. These kids are going to be on their own and all the lessons you've taught them, they've heard them. They know them. They're in there. You could repeat yeah. them, but they're already in there. There's nothing really that you can say to these teenagers that they haven't already heard. Does that mean that they're going to stop making mistakes? Nope. Are they going to have to learn through natural consequences that when you don't do stuff, you're going to flub up. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to even have some failures. Yes. And that's the hardest part to a parent because it seems, uh, it seems it's almost painful to watch kids make mistakes. Even as you know, it's a blessing that they make mistakes with you while they're living with you because there's a safety net. They can fall and you're there to support them. Um, so Kathy, do you want to talk a little bit about eggnog? Because um, I feel like we talked a bit about this, the typical approach, and I think a couple more slides we have, kind of how do we get a little bit more proactive? So okay. Keep yeah. Okay. So eggnog is a, it's really, do we have this slide on eggnog? Yeah, the next one. Yeah. Keep going. Uh, one more. Sorry. Keep going. Sorry. Here we okay. go. Oh, yeah, I love that, Gina. Um, so how can we adopt a proactive parenting approach? This one technique is one that if you could practice this, this one technique seems really easy. It is not easy but it is incredibly useful in helping 
you to disengage from, in other words, you not taking on your child's uh, emotional difficulties. Because when you take it on and it becomes yours, by proxy, it, it isn't theirs. And they don't learn by feeling what they're feeling, understanding that distress, feeling upset, feeling distress is not a bad thing. They're not going to die from feeling distress. Because our, as a parent, we want to save them from that distress because we can't stand seeing them unhappy. And it's really painful. But it's important that they feel distress. As we know as adults, distress just happens. It's part of life. And being upset and being disappointed and making mistakes and having failures is part of what life is about. And it's really important that they experience them. You're actually not doing them any favors if you save them from their own feelings about things. So eggnog is, it's an approach that helps build resilience in your children. It helps you to self-monitor so that you can maintain your calm. It helps turn over the problem solving for your child's problems back to them. So that helps you to move back into that consultant versus manager position. And it teaches your child to self-soothe. That's what this eggnog is, okay? Oh, it's breaking up for this person. I'm sorry. No, I think um, I think it was just. I think she maybe should sign off and try signing on again. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um. So I'm going to give you an example. So because it helped. I think examples help. Um. Uh. But, okay. I'll, uh. Would you let just give me a little feedback? Do you guys want an example about homework? Do you want an example about uh, a child who's upset about their peer group? Uh, do you want an example about homework? Getting out of bed, yes, homework, example of homework. I think homework might have won or chores. Okay. <laughs> Opposition. Okay, let's do let's do a little bit of homework. Now, this one, this example is, um, I think this is a good one. So uh, a boy I was working with, he was in uh, middle school at the time and he procrastinated like crazy on homework. And his both his parents would try to be very supportive supportive and they would remind him and he would say, yeah, 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 I got it under control. I know what I've got to do. Um, he was one of those kids that was trying to figure out how you could do the least possible amount of work and still come out with a decent grade. He was a, a good student. He wasn't a, a poor student, but he would inevitably procrastinate um, until the very last minute and make his parents cuckoo because you know they were you know he he would take it so close to the line um but he managed so this this time he um he waited till the very last minute to do to turn in a bunch of math homework and he managed to do it and he said you know, and he had an F. I mean, he had an F at this point. And, but he said the next day there was a, a quiz that he was going to take in, in class and he was ready for it. And so it was all good. So the next day, what happens? Snow day. This was back before there was COVID. Um, there was a snow day. And so the math teacher didn't give the, the test. And he graded based on the kid's other work. 
And so the kid basically got like a C minus for the grading period. And the kids, the kid was really upset. And he was like, I can't believe the t- upset with the teacher. I can't believe that she told us she was going to do a quiz. She said she was going to do a quiz. It's not my fault. It was snowing. You know, I can't believe we didn't have school. She should let us make it up. She should, right? So what do you think the parents are thinking as the child is, is going off in this way? Any, any guesses? I think the parents are, 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 I told you so, exactly. They are, you know, serves you right. I told you so. This is what they want to say. But they've been working on their eggnog skills. Because if they said, I told you so, how many times do we have to tell you you have to do your homework sooner? You know, what's the matter with you? This isn't the teacher's fault. This is your fault, right? <laughs> the kid then would, as you can imagine, escalate and get very angry at the parents. Meantime, he's not learning anything from his previous mistake because he's getting upset and dumping it on his parents and his parents are rightfully upset about it. And right this time, his parents who've been working on eggnog for a really long time, they respond to him, oh, Empathize, number one. You must be really upset. You, and and they did it with no sarcasm. This is really hard. You have to leave the sarcasm out of it. They wanted to say, oh, you waited till the last minute. And then, you know, now you feel bad. That obviously is not true empathy. You have to do it in a very neutral way. And remind yourself, if you're starting to feel sarcastic or you're starting to feel like you're going from your own, like, I told you so, frame of mind, you got to pull back and go to number two, get neutral and say, That's, that sucks. You wanted to make it up and, and you had a snow day and you weren't able to fix it. You, you know, I can see you're really upset. Now, as the parents are doing this without lecture, without judgment, what do you think is happening with Daniel? I'm waiting for responses. He can't believe his ears. This is a very funny group. Yes, he can't believe his ears and he's calming. Yep. He's calming a little bit, just a little. <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. Who are you and what did you do with my parents? This is true. It takes time because he's automatically going to go back into the old way of behaving and expecting that if he does that, you're going to go back into your old ways of behaving. Then he disowns the need to change. And, you know, we're back at the races. So, yeah, it takes time. It isn't the first time that you do eggnog. It may be the 10th time that you do eggnog before he realizes, oh, this is on me. This is on me. I I just want to mention one thing that might help also the visual representation of what Sharon Mai said about the yelling cycle. We have also heard of it as um, climbing the ladder. Because what happens is it's like the ping pong going back and forth when the kids yell and then you yell and then kids yell. Sometimes I find that um, the visual helps people because they're also like watching it in front of them, right? The kid's getting all mad and then we're getting mad and then it's just, there's never end to it. It's kind of like if someone pushes you and what are you going to do? Your natural reaction is to push back right. and climbing, climbing the ladder with our, with our kids doesn't get us anywhere. It just keeps going. It's like the never ending ladder. So it's true. And until it usually like there's some kind of an explosion, no going back, which stops it. And that's that also is is it's not the right direction. What you're hoping right. to do is get it to go down. And down, that's what, exactly. that's what the narrow piece is. When you get yeah. 
because usually what happens with kids is, or, or even adults, you can use this with adults, is after they felt heard, after they vented, right? You've heard this a million times, even with your spouses, right? I just want to vent. I don't want to fix. I just want to vent. They just want to vent. He's frustrated. He's upset. His first go-to is to blame the teacher. It's going to be to blame you. It's going to be to blame everybody but himself. You got to let him go through that. You can't save him from those feelings, right? So, And then he, you'll hear it begin to come down, like some of you observed. He starts to go from being like a five down to like a three of upset. And that's when you get to the narrow stage. And narrowing is when you, you try to help them focus in on sort of what's bothering you the most about this or which part, is there a part of this that you could use our help on? Or, you know, that's when you can get to narrowing. If you do narrowing too quickly and the venting hasn't occurred and the ownership of the internalization hasn't occurred, you will can tell because they'll escalate again. And if they do that, just go back to empathy and go and start again until they're more able to hear the narrowing. Questions? So Kathy, the <laughs> empathy is about the validation not necessarily that they were right, but the validation that their feelings are real, that they're really upset. And in this case, we know that kids really do want to do well. And even though there may have executive function challenges, which were initiation, as you described in this, and some other, maybe some challenges in getting going and why they procrastinated, we're empathizing at the beginning that their feelings are real. They really are upset. And that's really the point that it makes it easier sometimes for parents to empathize by not necessarily agreeing with them, like everybody said at the beginning, but necessarily that they're we're validating. And the getting neutral is the piece where we're not being sarcastic, right? We're being authentic. And then narrowing is really coming into maybe starting to turn that corner of like, how can we together help? How can we be help helping you now that we you do believe that we really do care about this? Is that is that a good summary? I I love there's a couple things you just said that I really, really like. <clears throat> the first is validation. Validation and being a validating parent is so critical. And knowing that validation does not mean agreement. I think it's very confusing as a parent. You know how do you validate something that you fundamentally don't agree with? Validation is about feeling. Agreement is about judgment. So we're, I'm asking you guys to validate the feeling and leave, leave out the judgment, the thinking part, for a little longer. How long does it take to go from empathizing to get moving? It depends on your kid. Depends on the situation, depends on the kid. There are some kids that they may be in that venting stage for like an hour and or more. And you might need to say, hey, I need to take a break because I, I gotta go to work. Um, you know, there could be a reason why you can't you can't keep processing in the feeling, but don't try to move to the fixing until you've gotten through the feeling and the validation piece. It's really hard to differentiate between validation. I get it. I get how you're feeling. It's really frustrating without getting to. But if you just didn't listen to me to begin it's so hard not to have the judgment piece come in. And what's optimizing then? Optimizing is figuring out a plan, if there's a plan. And sometimes the plan is um, uh, talk to your teacher um, about whether they're willing to give you a makeup. And they might say no. But it's something you can do it's sort of the, the optimizing is the getting moving on the piece of it you do have control over 
and understanding the piece of it that you don't have control over. What's happened has happened. You know, a, the sailboat has been launched, but there is a part of it that maybe you can do, or sometimes there's really nothing, it's already done, but next time you're going to do it differently. Mm-hmm. And that's how you learn to negotiate change. Mm-hmm. And the get moving is, is the implementing of the plan and also making sure that that when the plan is implemented, that you check back in and say, how'd it go? You know, did it go well? Did it not go well? You know, do you want to talk some more about it? Come up with another plan? Um, Where are you at today? Take the temperature of your child and let your child take the lead on whether or not they want to talk more. They don't want to talk more. They're in acceptance of it. Um, Does that make sense? so I'm just, Kathy, yeah. Qu- quick question about some of these questions. So I, th- I think that makes a lot of sense in the example you gave. But now when we have when we want them to do something, like we want them to start their homework or we want them to do their chores, we want them to get off their screens. Can you give can you kind of run through this with what example you would give? Um, because we know obviously we talk a lot here about executive function skills and how can we change their environment and actually um, create these on ramps to help with initiation because obviously engaging them with a particular activity like homework in small but important ways creating start routines etc are things that are really important but um but you know there is a category of things fighting with siblings you know you almost like want them to stop doing something like getting off their screen so they can go do their homework or stop fighting with their siblings what are your thoughts about an example with that or could you run down kind of how you would say that very tricky um, especially during COVID. And by the way, um, sort of everything needs to be caveated because of COVID. You know, don't be hard on yourselves as parents. The fact that you've survived the last year with your kids living in the same house with you and not having a structure and some of those kids not being kids that learn well Uh, without the structure of school, you got to give yourself major, it's sort of like lower your expectations of yourself, of your kids, and say to yourself, are they alive? Have I read them? Seriously, that's what I really recommend because this is extraordinary. And some kids, not many, some kids do okay, but most kids are really struggling and you're seeing more of yourself as in stress in the stuff that you be your behavior intensifies and you're seeing more of your kids so if they tend to be shut down you're going to see them shut down more if they tend to be argumentative you're going to see them be more argumentative so it's really important that you you constantly and consistently tell yourself this will pass This is not how it's going to be when things get better. And this has been incredibly long for everybody. Um, In terms of the homework thing, I think it varies very much by age. You know, what you can do with an eight-year-old to set a structure for doing homework and what you can do with a teenager is is very different. You're trying to help a teenager learn to negotiate their time and manage their time effectively, despite that they have all of these incredibly dopamine um, fulfilling activities by phone, social media, computers, video games. You're trying to teach them how to lead a balanced life and to be able to give enough time to exercise, give enough time to their health, give enough time to play, give enough time to work. And it's really difficult when we haven't been able to go out, there's been a lot less social, you know, uh, connection, not being able to uh, 
be in a structure. So, you know, there's movement in that over time. And how I see it is if you have a teenager, there is a lot more conversation about, hey, I don't like being a nag. I don't want to be a nag any more than you want me to be a nag. And I expect you to do your work before you do your play. So how can we do that? Because I'd really like to nag less and I'm really working on nagging less. And how can you do what you need to do to help me nag less? And to try to set up a plan, less about consequences, because once you give something to a kid, it's really hard to take it away. It's much easier to have them, like we do in our work, you work and then you get paid for your efforts and then you play. It's really hard to do that when they're playing and they're working and it's all in the same venue, right? And they can switch on and off. It, it's, it makes it incredibly difficult. Mm -hmm. But most teenagers, if they are not in the moment, a heated, a nagging, it's not coming in a place of like emotions, but it's really coming at a place when things are relatively calm. You can have a conversation develop a plan and then sort of say, okay, and let's check back in to see if the plan is working a week from now, sort of like you would if you were setting up a uh, some kind of meeting at work where you're doing employee assessments, you know? How am I doing as a nag? How are you doing as a, a working person? You know, are we working together? Own your own stuff. It's really important for teenagers that you own your own stuff and then help them to own their stuff too. Uh, and we, we have a whole uh, series of webinars that we're happy to share too about, you know, sometimes it's about understanding that need behind the behavior, what's happening. So when kids aren't starting things or they're having a difficult time transitioning, um, executive functions include, of course, initiation and inhibition. And so sometimes it is, they it really just is very challenging for them to get started. So how can you help them engage? How can you help them with the process? And here we help them by just let's start with the create the start routine. Let's create a routine to get you going to help transition from a preferred, if you will, activity to a non-preferred activity. You know, so how do we um, pick our favorite playlist? Hopefully it doesn't have words, get a snack, and then let's pop open the portal and put together a plan of, of attack of how we're gonna get going with, with a particular work and and you know once planning itself is an initiation strategy right how we plan um when we have a plan for something it's easier to get started on it and i think a lot of times we do think it's they're not motivated or they just don't want to you know they they don't care about their work but the truth is really they're just struggling with how to get started and i'm sure you see that all the time um and and there are a lot of great tips and tricks. We actually even have a PDF on our website we'll share later too about, you know, what is what are executive functions and how are those really sometimes, most of the time, the culprit behind some of these challenges. Now, you know, it's just like emotional control is an executive function and it's a challenge with um, kids, siblings that are fighting. I'm sure you see that as well, Kathy. And so, you, you know, again, you have to go through this eggnog, which is empathizing. You know, I know it's really super hard for you to get started. Um, so let's try to think collaboratively about what a start routine might be that can help you transition. And, um, you know, the same type of approach that you just talked about, uh, which I think is really, is really key. Um, let's move to another room, let's give ourselves some kind of a reward to put ourselves in our comfy chair, get our favorite non-alcoholic drink. <laughs> I don't say get our favorite drink, but, you know, there's a lot of, uh, of those types of things that can help us with that optimizing, you know, that idea of, you know, creating the best and optimal type of environment so that we can get moving when it comes to um, getting homework done. The other thing to keep in mind, because I think what you said is really important, Debbie, is that they may not act like it, 
but they're incredibly frustrated. Uh, you know, they can see that other kids do not have trouble getting started like they do. Mm-hmm. And they can see that as much as they want to succeed, <clears throat> if they're not able to get themselves to do what they want to do, um, mm-hmm. especially our kids with ADHD, for example, um, they know it. And it it's pile on when you are frustrated too, because they're also frustrated. And they, I think that part of just having someone like you, Debbie, like having an outside person who can be neutral, um, it was, it's very useful. I know I have three kids and my, my uh, younger two were both, both have ADHD and my middle son, I could see sort of the writing on the wall in early high school that it, homework was really affecting our relationship. I felt like so much of our, our interactions were about homework, have you, did you, have you. I felt like a trained parrot, you know? And so he, I ended up uh, sending, he went to a, um, like a homework, uh, you know, study center. Mm-hmm. And and I took it out of my, so then I, I just stopped asking. I, I could mm-hmm. stop asking. It, it helped me to stop asking. And then we could really reconnect because my, my main goal with everything with the kids is I want to have a relationship with my kids when they're adults. I, I wanted them to come home and say hello. And after they graduated college, if that's what they were going to do, uh, I wanted to still have a relationship and homework. I didn't want to have homework of all things uh, dictate what my relationship with my child was going to be. Um, so getting an outside person can sometimes help too, or if, even if like one of, if you have a two parent family and one of you is, is sort of able to stay more neutral, you know, have them take over the homework a little bit so that the other one can just focus on doing fun stuff and enjoying your your child. Because that really the the planting, you know, homework is a is a major like a, a chit, you know, like not a chit, uh uh it's a a wounding in the relationship. It's like a I mix my metaphors all the time, but it's sort of like <laughs> Um, a bank deposit versus withdrawal. And homework is major withdrawal as seen by your child, probably by you too. And so before you know it, you could be do you could be running on negative in your household because you haven't been doing all the replanting, the conscious, intentional things that you do that replant, hanging out, watching them play a video game taking a walk, ha- going out for coffee together. Uh, these are all ways of replanting. And if you have a major homework deficit running, you got to really work and consciously mm-hmm. work on replanting. And sometimes the replanting, it, it doesn't feel natural because you're feeling so frustrated, but I really encourage you to do it anyway. And also sometimes you might get rejected by them because now they're adolescents and that's your job. They're supposed to reject you. Um, So then it's like finding ways through the side door, you know, driving them to activities, letting them play their music in the car, you know, all of those ways of redepositing so that when you do have an argument or you do have something where you're, you're trying to work something out together, you have all those deposits that you're sitting on. Mm-hmm. You know? That's a great, that's a great uh, way to kind of start wrapping things up. It's about the deposits and withdrawals. And it, it is so true. I mean, a lot of the concepts you talk about are so important. You know, the idea that validations, feeling and agreements, judgment, and really trying to not judge and um, be neutral about expectations of the family, especially, and we've seen a lot about screen time um, and uh, and how hard that is for sure to set those expectations of family that this is only the only time is screen time and then we're going to this other space maybe to do our homework um validating yeah it really stinks it's, it's but uh, of course all of this is really hard and we know ne- we don't have all of the answers uh, for sure but hopefully um through the eggnog we have some kind of a structure 
Um, and, you know, get a sense, we, we could probably just move to the end now that it's 10 and just share a little bit. If people want to find your book, um, uh, we have this. I actually have all of these links that I'll share in the follow-up email. Uh, but I also have a, a few sample worksheets that you might like to, to play exactly. with. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to put those in the chat actually right now so that everybody can have us. Um, I will say, and there we go. Um, I'll also, also send these out, but um, Kathy, the, the work that you're doing is so important. I really recommend the, the workbook. I think sometimes just thinking, I, I just went through it and dog-eared so many pages and went through it and to in order to create this, it's so helpful to really just think about, you know, what are the things that trigger us? How do I rate myself and my own self-care? Um, but I really want to say to all the participants, and certainly Kathy, you, um, for all the work that you've done, we've had, as you said, a really tough year, and hopefully everybody kind of felt validated themselves by being here. Um, if you want to go forward one more um, slide, or one or two, I think, um, it will give contact information for you and for us if anyone wants to kind of talk one-on-one. -on -one. Oh. Uh, Kathy, yours just looks a little bit dark, but I can put the, obviously I'll put the um, contact information in the follow-up email, but um, really feel free to um, reach out and I will put this in here for everybody. And uh, if, if you if you feel like you need some parent coaching, you know, yeah. do parent coaching at the office, sometimes um, I find in this way, uh, teletherapy has been very useful because I can see parents where, where, you know, mom might be at work and dad's at home or vice versa. And um, we can sort of work on, you know, keeping everybody accountable through teletherapy. There, It's relatively short term. I, I find it's not like, you know, you're in therapy, Woody Allen, uh, you know, forever. It, it's more like kind of getting you both on the same page mm -hmm. and um, sometimes getting the also the kid involved to do some family work together so that we can get you guys moving forward um, with making things happier at home and easier, not so stressful. Yeah, absolutely. And it's so true, David, that if parents have a break, we could probably be better. Um, which is why self-care, Kathy, is part of one of the things you talk about in the book. I think it is really so important so that we get like a almost like a vacation, an emotional, mental vacation, and just you know, um, I can't tell are you more able. Times, yeah, I, I tell families that are if you have a significant other, you got to make time for each other, where you like have yeah. a moratorium on talking about the kids. Mm -hmm. Like you just yeah. go to improv or you go someplace like movies or you take a walk and you just laugh because mm -hmm. um, you need that yourself to be able to, you're all, you know, you're, you're running on empty and, you know, nobody can do their best work when they're running on empty. Well, it, so, so true. And with the laughing, I'll kind of leave you with this, which is the, the big thing in our house has become dad jokes. And that's what my daughter and, uh, and my husband have found it over is is who can find better dad jokes. So it does get us laughing and it keeps us off of the homework topic <laughs> and everything that has to be done. But um, thank you for sharing all of your expertise, Kathy. Really appreciate it. Sorry to have put uh, put you in charge of the slides when without expecting it. But as we said, we're being flexible. And thank you to everybody who participated so much. Um, we you really appreciate it my email out, right? In case somebody has questions. Yeah. I'm going to send all of your contact information and resend the link. So everyone will have that as well as a replay of this webinar. So um, we very much appreciate it. And we hope everybody has a great day and can practice eggnog today because I know for sure I'll be thinking of it in mind when I go home to ask my home, my daughter what homework she has. I'm going to reframe that. <laughs> all right. You Thanks, too. everybody. Have a good day. Thank you, everyone. Really appreciate everybody's participation. Bye-bye.